Welcome everybody, and I'm happy to introduce you to Mark Robinson, who is a Golden Apple Award winning teacher who's here to talk to you today about curriculum and unit planning. Thank you. Um, I, I'm always a little intimidated to, to talk to a, a group like this. Um, other teachers always know what good teaching looks like, and I, I don't want to fall short of, of their hopes. I also don't want to become somebody's bad memory uh, of, uh, you know, that I had an opportunity to hear. Um, I, I don't purport to have a monopoly on the truth. What I really want to do is just share some of my experiences uh, that I have had over the last few years in putting uh, curriculum and things together. Um, I, I titled this sort of curriculum and, and unit planning as a political art uh, about deciding what knowledge and skills are worthy of time and what are not. Um, and there's a lot to that, uh, that this is really about making decisions. Um, and any kind of decision making process, not only does it matter what's decided, but also the process of how you decide. Uh, is worth looking at, reflecting on. So that's kind of what I want to want to talk about. Um, planning as an art. Uh, I, I picked the Revere silversmithing image there because Revere is an artist. Silversmithing is an art about you know forms and lines and shapes, but it also requires a tremendous amount of technical knowledge in terms of how molten silver flows. Uh, how it cools, how it shapes. And in my mind, teaching both you know, unit curriculum planning and all aspects of teaching are an art like that in that, yeah, you need certain technical knowledge to make the thing work, but there's also a tremendous aspect of creativity here. Uh, and that um, I have taught in a lot of different systems. I was in a, in a public school outside a military base in Kansas uh, for my first two years of teaching. Give you some idea of how bizarre this place was. On the new, or new Teacher Orientation Day, I was presented a two-page list of every acronym that they used within the district. Uh, and it still took me a long time to figure out, what are you talking about? Uh, there were so many different words I didn't understand. Um, I've taught in small systems. Uh, I taught in a, in a school on the south side of Chicago that was essentially you know, a principal and four teachers. And we had a, a, you know, a tremendous autonomy, uh, tremendous creative possibilities, but it also meant we didn't have a ton of support. Uh, and so kind of the, the, the art of the system is a challenge. Uh, you know, in terms of specific knowledge that teachers have to have, you know, what I have learned about brain development has been tremendously helpful in terms of how I can approach things. Uh, that when I look out, I, I spent most of my career doing high school, so as I look out at a 15-year-old who has just said something outrageously rude, and I've looked at him and I've said, do you have any idea how rude what you just said was? And he looks at me with a blank stare. And I realize, no, he has no idea. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes down and reminds me, quit hollering, start teaching, uh, that this is a moment to sort of do something. Uh, that's been helpful, uh, to realize that what the hostility that's directed at me, this isn't about Mark Robinson, this is about the office Mark Robinson holds. Uh, so that's what I, I kind of mean by sort of a, planning as an art and a creativity. Um, I, I don't know how much I want to rant about bureaucracy. Um, one of my frustrations has been that the bigger the system I've worked in, bureaucrats want things uniform, uh, and it, there is a, sometimes it can stifle the creativity, uh, stifle creative process. Uh, I, I've chosen to spend most of my career in private education. It's meant a financial sacrifice to do it, but it's offered opportunities to do things in a little bit more creative, a little bit different way. Uh, and I felt like the trade-off is worth it, but I also coming, you know, my heart's a libertarian one. Um, I don't want to tell other people how to live their lives, and I don't tell other people what their choices should be or, or, or 
you know, how, how, to, how to look at that, but that there is a, um, there's a trade-off uh, in that you know, all, all lives are about kind of a trade-off. Um, I call this a political act, and I, again, I've spent, excuse me, most of my uh, career teaching sort of history, political science, um, politics is a big thing. We tend to, to think of it, and I at least thought of it initially as strictly, this is about partisanship, this is about Democrats, this is about Republicans. And it was a, a teacher of mine at University of Iowa who sort of expanded my mind and said, it's really about two things. Anytime you have scarce resources, and anytime you have to decide what's valuable, that's a political act. Um, and frequently what I find is when people tell me, oh, Robinson, leave politics out of this. What they're really trying to tell me is, your opposition to this is unreasonable. Please stop uh, talking right now so that we can move on with the, with the business that we're about. Uh, what you choose to, to keep into a unit, into a curriculum, is a political choice. You're deciding this topic is more valuable than this topic, uh, and I'm leaving it out. Uh, the scarcest resource that, that I feel like I have in education is 180 days. Uh, and I don't have any more, and I cr can't create time out of nothing. And every minute I spend teaching about one topic is a minute I don't have to teach about something else. Um, and spending many, much of my career in history, what I tended to find was that decisions were made less consciously and more sort of by accident. Well, let's start at the beginning of the book and we'll just keep going and then when we run out of time, we'll just stop. And I finally had a, angry is the wrong word, I'm trying to think what a better word for it is, uh, spirited perhaps, spirited conversation uh, with other faculty members that said, look, the way we're doing this, you, you realize we're saying that the events of the 1870s are more important to talk about than the events of the 1970s. Is that what we want to say to the universe? And if it's not, then we need to think differently about how we're spending our time. But we need to think consciously about this is what we want to spend time on. This is what we don't want to spend time on. And at least as a teacher of world history, which is my, my background, there is always something else we could include. Uh, that most of my career has been spent deciding, why are we going to leave this unbelievable, what seems like, an unbelievably important event in world history, why are we going to leave this out? Uh, because there simply is not enough time to teach everything, so we have to be deliberate about the choices that we include. Um, part of me, you know, in terms of how to plan curriculum, there is a feeling uh, that maybe this has already been done. You know, hasn't you know, all of the standards been set and so forth? And to an extent, that's true. Uh, the standards have been set, uh, I have a much longer rant about how those are set, um, which involves Marxist categories. I think I'm going to say that one actually for the next slide. Uh, I'll do it there. Um, but the, even within those standards that do exist, there is a certain latitude. Um, I am frustrated in that I, I'm less upset with, with what the Common Core standards are as much as I am how they have been made uh, and how they have been, um, um, how they've, I, I hesitate to use the word imposed on, on the states, but it's a straight, it, it feels to me like the, the federal government found a way to create a national set of standards without actually admitting this is a national set of standards we would like. Uh, because if they want to just say we have a national set of standards, now they've got to have a bigger conversation about federalism, they have to have a bigger conversation about whether this laudable goal is in fact within the purview of the federal government to do. Uh, again, this is my own sort of libertarian agenda that's starting to creep out, but uh, th this, is, you know, uh, th this is sort of who I am. Uh, this is what I grew up in, was the, the, uh, the Bradley Commission on History in Schools uh, and its recommendations for sort of how to go forward. Um, there are standards within buildings, there are standards within districts. Um, that said, uh, when they're written at their best, 
Standards promote a unity of sort of planning, but they don't necessarily promote a uniformity, uh, that there is still decisions to be made within that. Uh, all right, this is where I want to rant about how school reform decisions are made. Uh, and I don't want, you know, again, my heart is libertarian, but I'm, I'm going to just drop into some Marxist categories here and rant about this for a while. I don't think it's by accident that the fact that a, a majority of teachers are female affects the way school reform is done. Um, this is where the Marxists speak of a feminized profession. Uh, that it seems strange to me that when we talk about reforming medicine, that the doctors always play a loud and public role in that. Uh, that everybody knew that the only chance Obama had to reform health care was if he could get the AMA on board. And if he couldn't get AMA, the American Medical Association on board, then don't even bother. Uh, that that had killed that program in the 40s when Truman had tried it. Uh, that the opposition in the 90s probably doomed Clinton's attempt. There doesn't seem to be any sense of that with education reform. Um, and that I'm not entirely unconvinced that part of this is a sexist argument that women are incapable of doing certain things and they must be supervised. We have a superintendent of education. Do we have a state superintendent of medicine? Do we have a state superintendent of, of, of lawyering? I don't know what that would be called. Uh, <coughs> all of this just sort of feels weird to me, that, that I'm, ang yeah, I'm angry, that it doesn't feel like teachers have a, a seat at the table as we're talking about how we're actually going to fix this thing. Uh, so I, I should probably not rant on that further. I should also point out, um, there's, I know there's a time for questions and answers at the end, mm -hmm. but if something like is bothering you or feels interesting or you want more commentary on it, you should just interrupt uh, and just say, well, what about this? What about, you know, you're out of line here, you know, wait a minute. Uh, I, I, that's, I, I, th I think I want to you know, make sure that's clear. Um, what I want to spend most of my time though today is looking at um, a case study here uh, for what happened at St. Pius in the last five years. Uh, we had a perfect storm of curriculum planning excitement. We had two veteran teachers uh, leave the department, um, which left me as the only person who had taught world history. And so we're bringing in two new teachers. Um, all of us were educated in a particular way, I call steeped in the liberal arts tradition, broadly educated. Uh, you know, that one, you know, out of an art history background, our politics, uh, you know, that we had taught, been taught physics and chemistry, um, and so forth. So we're coming in with a really broad idea of kind of what, what it means to be an educated person. Um, that for us, for the three of us, history was really about exploring big questions. Uh, history as reflective inquiry. It wasn't really about specific pieces of content. Uh, and so we shared that, um, we shared that in common. And then we got hit with sort of uh, a court ruling from the outside. This is uh, Moses versus, I can't remember the other party involved, but essentially said the state of New Mexico can no longer make available uh, instructional materials funds to religious schools, which meant we just, you know, all, our, all our funding resources got cut off. Uh, and so we had to think about, okay, what do we want to do uh, with, what do we want to do with textbooks? Um, and having, the first year we just said, okay, we'll lean on the parents, we'll ask them to go buy textbooks. And they did, and they were good. But the more we thought about it, the more we realized, you know, we've complained for years about how we don't like this particular textbook or this other particular textbook. We're not locked in anymore. Maybe we need to have a different kind of conversation about what we want to do, uh, what we want to do going forward. The other piece was all of us had done professional development through an organization called the Liberty Fund, 
Uh, this is a libertarian leaning organization. They have a lot of private money. Their essential mission is get primary documents in front of students. If you want to know what James Madison thought about the Constitutional Convention, then start reading James Madison. And that had a powerful effect on all of us that we said, why are we having the, the students read about Gandhi? Why are they reading about Nelson Mandela? This stuff is accessible. We could figure out a way that they could actually read Gandhi, that they could read Mandela. Why don't we start thinking about how we could build a curriculum around just doing that? Um, it would mean a lot of other kinds of things. This is where I want to go on another tangent about does, uh, does the philosophy of education matter? I never understood why that was always the standard interview question. What's your philosophy of education? Because my thought always was, so what, why does that matter? But the more I got into this process, the more I realized it actually does and it does a lot. And that I was in a privileged spot with these two other women that they had hired. And that we all share the same kind of philosophy. Um, content versus skills. Uh, which is more important, learning how to do something or learning specific pieces of content? We were all, the three of us, Sheila Jennings, at Lisa Mochtinger, and I, were all in agreement that what matters more than anything else in a history curriculum is a specific set of skills. Being able to read critically, being able to write analytically, being able to understand the structure of an argument, being able to offer criticism and evaluation of the structure of an argument. And whether we were doing that about the French Revolution or apartheid in South Africa didn't matter as long as we could do that set of skills somewhere. What that did was free us from a mindset that there was a specific body of content that we had to include. Now, I'm not sure we could have pulled this off if we were all teaching Algebra 1. Uh, I think there would have been a different kind of conversation that would have had to have happened. Um, this is unbelievably controversial at the school where I work. Are we in the business of telling the truth to children so that they can memorize it and live it? Or are we in the business of providing tools for children to go out and find the truth? Uh, what makes it controversial is that, well, for the most part, no one cares if I do this in my social studies curriculum. If we propose to do this in the religion curriculum, all hell breaks loose. Uh, that this really becomes controversial. Uh, but it's a, real, it's a real question. Because if we're going to empower people to go look for the truth, and I've seen this in my own house, that my youngest son and my wife will argue about all sorts of different political questions. And at some point, she will turn and look at me and say, you did this. Uh, I did what? She, you taught him how to think independently like this, and now he thinks uh, you know, that gun ownership is a natural right. And I said, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but that, that was the philosophy we brought in. That's what makes it dangerous, is that we will get, I will get children who end up thinking not really the way I thought about these issues. Uh, and it, it makes me a little bit. Um, I guess Concord versus Subversion is related to this. I, I'm one of a, a very small number of Protestants teaching in a profoundly Catholic institution. Uh, and so that's always put me in a sort of a strange spot of quiet subversion. I'll just leave it there and move on. Uh, I, the, three, the, the four German mathematicians there are from a story that I read about several years ago. I can't quite remember all of the details, but it's essentially uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, one of the great German mathematicians at the University of Göttingen, had, was in the process of building a department as strong as he possibly could in mathematics. And he brought in Felix Klein, who was an unbelievably difficult man to work with. Uh, and the question came up, they needed to get, bring in more faculty. And one of the people that they could look at was Bernard Riemann. Um, and there was another candidate. And Gauss asked Klein, which of these guys is more difficult to work with? And he said, Riemann is more difficult by far. He said, okay, get Riemann. Because he's going to challenge us on all of, our all of our preconceived notions. He's going to force us to think through very carefully everything we're doing. And that's going to make it 
that's going to bring us up, um, kind of raise our game, if you will. Um, and so that's another aspect of, in terms of what are we trying to do in education? Do we want people who can um, sort of accept things as they are, or do we want people who are going to challenge things? You know, do we want the rabble rousers, if you will? Uh, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I, 20 years ago, I thought I had an easy answer to this. I'm not sure I do anymore. Uh, because part of me, as I'm 50 years old, is looking out and saying, okay, some of these institutions that I wanted to smash when I was young actually have great value, and I would prefer them not to be smashed anymore. Uh, I would prefer them to be questioned. Uh, so I guess I want to leave it there. Um, how we actually did the process. We started out, the three of us sat down uh, over coffee during the summer, and we looked at what do we want to do going forward this next year? Um, are we started asking those questions that are there. What are we already doing? What's already in our curriculum? What seems to be working about that? What seems to be not working about it? What are the standards asking us to do? Um, where, and this is the hardest one for us to struggle with. What can we reasonably accomplish within it? Yes. Do you mind if I make a snapshot of that? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, what can we reasonably, and what makes this difficult is the fact that we have to take the students where they are, but we also have to put them in a zone where they are challenged to grow bigger. That if we just leave them where they're comfortable all the time, we've done nothing good. But if we stretch them and stress them all the time, then we accomplish nothing. And so trying to figure out what's a reasonable amount was unbelievably difficult. And this was, we found was a question we had to go back and address year after year after year. Uh, I remember one of the comments one year was you know, this particular aspect of the French Revolution, which was, we were finding unbelievably difficult. Sheila finally looked at me and she said, we either need to spend 10 minutes on this or we need to spend five days on this. We, we can't really do this anything in between where we're trying to do a little bit about this because we're just sowing an enormous amount of confusion. And so we would have to talk about that. Okay, if we want to spend more time on that, then what, is we going to, what are we going to spend less time on? Because we're not going to magically create stuff. Yeah, there's a certain amount of inefficiency we could squeeze out of the curriculum, but that's shockingly small. Uh, so we're really going to have to figure out what, it, what does this mean. Um, that's where this little diagram comes in, in terms of what are the core ideas, the core concepts, the core skills that we really want to walk away from. Uh, this was, Sheila introduced me to a term of enduring understandings. What do you want the kids to know about this 50 years from now? What do you want to be able to do 30 years from today? That's where we need to focus our attention, she maintained. And I think she was, she was exactly right. Um, that what are, what are the things of endurance that we want that we can't get rid of? Um, and you know, inherent in a question like this, what pieces of content do we think are most important is, of course, a decision about, well, what do we think is less important? Because if it's less important, then we can probably let go of that. Uh, what I'd like to do with your permission is just try an activity mm -hmm. with this, if, if you guys are okay with this. I, I realize I lack the usual coercive power I have in my classroom to just <laughs> tell people to do stuff. Uh, because many of you are, as my father would say, free and over 21 uh, and can simply walk away. Uh, but in, with, with your <laughs> indulgence, I'd like you to think about this with the with people at your table, or if you want to move around. Um, think of a, a, either a, a class you teach or a, a class off the list. These are sort of the broad, I'm thinking like whole year learning goals. And just think of what would, what are the five, did I say, did I spell out five? Let's put a number on that. Yeah, let's put five ideas on there that you think are the most important to walk away from at the end of the year? Does this... It, it, the end of the year or the end of the career, their high school career? Let's call it a... Um, end of their high school career, end of the year. Thoughts? 
year? Year. Okay. The end of a one-year class on some, uh, you know, something like this. And again, you, don't be limited, don't be tyrannized by the categories I have posted on the slide. Uh, you know, those of you who are already teaching, if you want to just take the class you're already working in, start there. Uh, you know, if you haven't been teaching yet, think about what, what do you want to do. Um, yeah, so you can come up with, come up with a class title. What is the class you're, you're teaching? See, uh, five of the enduring understanding. Take a couple of minutes right. on that. Is that what you don't have to write this down. You don't have to turn anything in. Table leaders. I didn't actually have you designated. Who, but, but somebody who would like to just share what the table came up with in terms of critical mm -hmm. skills, enduring understandings. You want to start? Sure. Right here. Uh, I teach second grade, so we talked just about ELA in general. Okay. Um, and so we picked explaining their ideas to each other and demonstrating their understanding through conversations because sometimes, especially for the little ones, it's hard to actually have a conversation. I, I have freshmen who are shockingly bad at that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I have juniors who are bad at that. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. <laughs> um, recognize their, that their ideas and other, and other people's ideas have value. So to be respectful to each other when sharing ideas, um, understanding main ideas and details when reading a story, uh, how to effectively work with a group even if they have disagreements, um, and making infinite inferences and connections with the text, like connect it to world events, other stories themselves, that kind of thing. I, what, what, what strikes me is that, that that's sort of a a shockingly similar list to what we had, what we talked about, you know, in, in a, obviously in a different context, but that a lot of those same ideas about you know, being able to converse with one another, being able to respect the ideas of others, uh, being able to respect the ideas of those we disagree with, uh, profoundly difficult mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. Thoughts here? Um, well, our the list that, that we came up with, we, we had four things that we talked about. One is to be able to think critically. One is to be able to problem solve, whether it's problem solving in whatever context, whether it's math or physics or English language arts or interpersonal relationships or whatever it might be, um, to be able to communicate effectively. Because whether you're communicating about math or communicating about science or whatever, you need to be able to read well, you need to be able to write well, you need to be able to speak well. Um, and then finally, to be able to, for lack of a better word, justify. So you should be able to support your position, um, whether it's your position that this is a correct mathematical solution, or your position that this is a new important idea in science, or your position that this is the central linchpin of this novel and the most important idea. So the idea that you can back up what you have that you're communicating. One of the, the, the real challenges I've, I, and I can only imagine that you guys have seen something similar with some of the freshmen I have is this notion that there are facts and there are opinions. And facts matter, but that all opinions are of some sort of nebulously equal value. That you and I have a difference of opinion on this topic, and I cannot criticize your opinion for any reason whatsoever. And I really struggle to try to get them to understand. No, your opinion is not as good because you don't have, you know, your your logic is shaky and your facts are non-existent. And I understand you feel passionately about this topic, but that you've got to bring more than that to the table. And I, that's where I uh, this you call it justification, but. Uh, is absolutely critical. That, that some of mine are shocked when I look at them and say, "No, all opinions are not equal." You know that one's better because it it has specific facts that are being used. Now we can we can call into question the underlying assumptions. We can say, you know, what I dis, you know disagree with the, the premises there, uh, but the, to just say, you know, well, that's my opinion. Uh, is difficult. Um, here. 
Um, so ours are a lot, they're, they're very similar. So we had like being able to write to convey ideas. We, we had picked the middle school English language arts. So write, being able to write to convey ideas clearly. Um, being able to read and understand what you read. Um, developing a love of, of reading. That's a heck of a, I like, Sorry. Yeah, I like it. Um, developing a love of reading, yeah, having a passion for it, finding a, a way to like that. that. And then um, application, right. Being able to take what you're seeing in class and apply it in a different environment, you know, to, to take what you learned here and to apply it someplace else. And then um, the last one we were just talking about was the ability to speak and convey your ideas orally, clearly to people. So that's it. I, the, the, I, I, I love that you mentioned you know, sort of a passion or a joy mm -hmm. uh, that, that sometimes we struggle with that a lot, but that we really did want to get, we wanted our freshmen to get a, to develop a passion for discussion about the big questions. Uh, even if we couldn't agree, even if we both came up with well-supported, well-justified statements of opinion, that landed us on opposite sides uh, of an issue, but that we could at least embrace that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but that that was a challenge. Uh, any other thoughts? Obviously, um, the, the thing that I really loved about this particular discussion is that all of you honed in on the idea that sort of the skills that we develop are probably in the long run far more meaningful than the specific content. Um, now, I don't want to minimize the need for specific content. Uh, you know, I, I also teach some remedial mathematics, and at some point, if my children do not understand how an equation works and how you go about isolating a variable, I have, in a sense, failed. Uh, and, and so content does matter, and I don't want to minimize that. But the, the way, at least the way we did our, our world history curriculum, we started from a position of what are the skills we really want, and now let's start building the content around how can we use specific blocks of content to develop specific skills. And that's what I would kind of want to jump into now. I had another activity, but I think we actually managed to do two of them together uh, in terms of these sort of enduring skills and so forth. Um, what we did was we continued our conversation, sat down and said, okay, what do we want to accomplish in terms of content? Looking at the curriculum standards we have been given by the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, by the state of New Mexico, we realized our focus for world history is on events that happened outside the United States in the 19th and in the 20th centuries, in the 1800s and the 1900s. And so we said, okay, well, we spend the first, school, first semester on, the, on the, the 19th century and the 1800s, Second semester in the 20th century and the 1900s. What is the critical event? You know, what, what are the most important events that we think we should be involved in? Yeah, and we started thinking about what are the events that have a worldwide effect? And the two that we finally sort of ha hashed out were the French Revolution and uh, the age of imperialism. Because these involved worldwide <laughs> things. Uh, that we were struck by uh, Rondo Cameron's argument uh, that, that changes in economic production are one of the few events that have a worldwide effect, uh, that, that this isn't a French event. Um, the French Revolution we, we stayed with because of the, the, the sheer number of disruptions, and it also allowed us to have a bigger conversation then about ideas about liberty, ideas about justice. And then the one that we really struggled with, which was where does violence fit in this idea of liberty and justice? Mm -hmm. um, and this has kind of been a gut issue for me. I grow, full disclosure, I'm not a pacifist. I have a profound respect for those people who are. Um, but that we have, we say, oh no, no, violence is never acceptable, but a as a country, the United States of America has never believed that. Uh, that. That Lincoln had zero problems using 
a whole lot of coercive force to end slavery and create a more justified, a more just society. Um, and what really struck us was that the, in, the, in the midst of all of this, in, in 2013, Nelson Mandela died. And we were trying to decide, what do we do with Mandela? Uh, that, that our students very, sort of the, shaped by the popular media, particularly Invictus. Nelson Mandela is everybody's grandfather. He's the one who brought concord and unity to South Africa. He brought blacks and whites together in this wonderful sort of the extent that it was a utopian <coughs> transformation. I said, yeah, but what do we want to do with Mandela of the 1950s? A very angry young man who has very clearly said this society is profoundly unjust, peaceful protest isn't changing it, and the solution is violence. How do we want to handle that? And it was Sheila Jennings who said, I think we have them struggle with the same question that Mandela struggled with. So let's look at how do we set that up. And so in the French Revolution context, that meant we struggle, we figure out a way to try to bring children into the world that is a profoundly unjust world and look at, okay, how do you want to transform it? How much violence do you want to use? Wow, isn't it interesting, once the violence gets going, I hate to personify stuff that's not real, but that the violence becomes its own energy, uh, that the violence has its own mindset, that the violence wants more violence, uh, and that do you think the people who turned the violence on really understood that, that how hard it was going to be to turn it off? And knowing that, would they have chosen a different, a different path? But again, trying to get people to embrace that. Um, it probably took us three years of teaching to realize what we, those were the three themes we really wanted to develop. We started out with a list of about 12 big questions in world history. And after several years and several conversations, we realized what we really want to focus on are those three ideas, liberty, justice. What does it mean to be a free person? What does it mean to live in a free society? What does justice mean? What does it mean to live in a just society? And finally, where does violence fit in any of that? Is it ever acceptable to use violence to transform a society? If so, under what conditions? And, you know, and, and where does that fit? Um, imperialism fits that nicely also because it's liberty and justice in its absence. You know, what, what would convince people that they have right to impose everything upon another, uh, another group of people? Um, it also uh, was sort of a fascinating study in the human condition in that the very same French and British and Americans who are speaking so loudly in the name of liberty and justice are also the same ones conquering Africa, conquering the Philippine Islands, conquering Asia, and, and trying to resolve that internal contradiction um, and, and getting kids to sort of, again, embrace the weirdness of it all uh, was where we went. Having decided those were the two things we wanted to focus on, we then figured, okay, what are the, what are the prerequisites we have to do? If we're going to talk about the French Revolution, we really need to talk about the ideas of the Enlightenment first. If we're going to talk about the French Revolution, we should probably look at, at its worldwide effects. How are we going to do that? Well, let's look at a single, you know, we could look at one case. Let's look at how the French Revolution uh, energized a different revolution in Haiti. That one's also fascinating in that it opens up a fascinating discussion about what does it mean to be a free person? Does it mean you have access to government, uh, that you can participate in government? Or does it mean you have access to land? And if you can only pick one, what do you want to pick? Most of my students always pick, I want a say in how government runs. And I'll point out that the, the, for the, the enslaved people of Haiti who have freed themselves, their first choice is we want access to land. And if we, we, we will give up a say in government if we can get a promise that we get a farm. Uh, and it, it creates a fruitful discussion about well, what does it mean to be a free person? What does freedom mean in this context, in any context? Um, when we wanted to talk about the Industrial Revolution, we realized, uh, I mean, when we wanted to talk about imperialism, we realized we have to talk about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, John Green, in his crash course, World History on Imperialism, points out, it's not that the Europeans didn't conquer Africa before because they didn't want to. They always wanted to, they just couldn't. Uh, the Industrial Revolution makes it possible. Uh, so we wanted to look at that. Uh, full disclosure, this has been the hardest unit for us to figure out. What do we want to teach about the Industrial Revolution? What is the essence of this particular bit of content? Um, 
We also read, we also realized that imperialism would lead us to the 20th century that we wanted to talk about uh, with World War I. Um, and then we would ask ourselves, okay, in, when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, is there a way we can continue these themes about liberty, about justice, about violence? And we realized quickly with the Industrial Revolution, okay, this opens up a whole social justice piece. You know, as the Industrial Revolution is enriching everyone, it's enriching some people a lot more. That the gap between the richest and the poorest is growing much, much bigger. Is that by itself unjust? Well, it turns out that's a really interesting question, and that people of goodwill can disagree, and that there's lots of stuff to think about with it. Um, and so we, that we realized very quickly we could do this. Uh, this would be something that we could be part of. Um, as we looked in terms of what do we want to do with the 20th century, we realized, look, if we're going to make a focus of the 19th century imperialism, then we have to make the, the end of that. It's probably got to be our focus for the 20th. Um, and then we also wanted to look at, you know, if the history of the French Revolution is about bringing about liberal systems, republican systems, okay, don't shoot me here, please. I mean liberal in the sense of classical liberal ideas, equality, natural rights, participation in government, not the Democratic Party. By Republican systems, I mean systems where the elected representatives of the people participate in government. I'm not talking about Trump. Uh, I don't want to talk about Trump right now. Um, and look at that it's in the 20th century that there's some fairly powerful alternatives being offered. It doesn't have to be a Republican system. It doesn't have to be a liberal system. And so we were like, okay, let's talk about those. From uh, if we're going to talk about the collapse of European empires, if we're going to talk about decolonization in Africa, then we have to look at World War II because that's what energized all of that. Um, that put World War II for us in a really different context. That we started emphasizing the world aspect of that rather than the war aspect of it, uh, and looking at you know how does this all fit together. Um, for the rise of, of the non-liberal, non-republican systems, we realize there's a whole bunch of alternatives in the 20th century. And this is where we had to sort of challenge, what do we want to talk about? How do we want to talk about it? We finally settled sort of on those four cases. We wanted to talk about the Russian Revolution. Uh, we wanted to talk about fascism. Uh, I lived through the Iranian Revolution. Uh, I was about 10 at the time. I didn't fully understand it. It was always presented to me in the lens of the Cold War, that somehow Iran was a part of a giant conflict between the US and the Soviet Union. I no longer really believe that. I think it's a much different kind of concept, that it really is about what is the nature of a representative government, what is the job of government, what does it mean to be a free person. Um, but again, it, it's an opportunity to look at different things. In all of this, what drove all of our thinking was how can we create conversations, particularly for, for us in world history, how can we create conversations around primary documents? Yeah, so honestly, we would sit down and think, okay, what do we want the kids to read about the French Revolution? We want them to read Robespierre's speech, uh, uh, report, on the, uh, report on public morality, where essentially he's making his case it is perfectly good to use violence to bring about a virtuous society. We want a conversation about that. That turned out to be unbelievably fruitful. Um, yeah, this was about two years ago. One of my, my students came in white as a ghost the next day, and I said, what's wrong? She said, I read that Robespierre speech. I read it twice. He makes a tremendous amount of sense. I'm not sure I wouldn't have followed him when I, if I had I been alive in that time period. I said, why is that troubling? Because he, because he executed 30,000 people and he made it seem like it was a good thing. I said, that's the danger, isn't it? And, and it opened a much bigger kind of conversation about this. Um, and so the challenge is to get the, for us anyway, was to get the context of, okay, here's the primary document. Now, what understandings do you need before you can understand that? Uh, 
okay, you're going to have to know something about the events of the French Revolution. You're going to have to know something about that. So starting to put together those pieces of secondary. What this culminated in was essentially we built our own textbook out of primary sources we could extract from the public domain, uh, secondary articles that we could get from various organizations. The Constitutional Rights Foundation was unbelievably helpful in doing this. The Watson Institute at Brown University was very good. Um, and then a couple of times we just had to bite the bullet and say, okay, we need an article about this particular topic. Which of us is going to write this article? Uh, and somebody's got to do it. Uh, but we sort of trying to create our own, um, to create our own instructional materials uh, in order to do that. Um, I'm going to move this along here. Um, I want to look now from the sort of from the big to the smaller. How do we put together a specific unit? In this case, the Industrial Revolution. So we started, again, with the question, what are the primary documents we want? We knew we wanted Marx. Uh, that Marx's echoes are all through the 20th century. I remember going to college and being shocked at how many different classes I ended up having to read about Marx. Uh, educational psychology had Marxist readings in it. Uh, human relations for the classroom teacher had Marxist sociology. Government, politics, economics, it was always there. Said, so, okay, we gotta have something. Now, obviously, we can't do everything about Marx, but at least introduce something uh, about Marx. Um, we want to look at Adam Smith, uh, the, the, the sort of the counterpart, the free, the classical liberal argument that if you let people interact freely, free trade generates wealth and so forth. Uh, let those two talk to one another. And then we struggled with, okay, what else do we want to include? How much, how much do we want to talk about the cotton gin? How much do we want to talk about technology and its changes? How much do we want to talk about the changing role of cities and urban areas? How much do we want to talk about uh, the changing roles of, of women in industrial cities? And that's a conversation that, that we are not finished with in terms of what do we want to do, what do we want to include, um, are, we can, you know, are we happy that this is the best unit that we can make it? Uh, and the short answer is we are not happy, we are not convinced this is the best unit we can create, um, but that if we can continue, we as the teachers who are in charge of this can continue to embrace the struggle that maybe we can get something positive here. Um, I just want to, just a couple of thoughts here. This is from the Virginia Declaration of Right, which I did not read until I was in my 40s. And I am so frustrated, uh, because when I read this in 2014, I'm like, you know what, where was this thought my whole life? Now, he's specifically talking about government. That in order for a Republican system to survive, there has to be a frequent re, uh, repetition, reimagination of what are the fundamental principles. But I realized this is true of what I do in education. That every year I need to stop and think about what exactly am I trying to accomplish this year? What is it that's going to, what is success going to look like in this context? Uh, and to have that conversation, the frequent repetition. I mean, the other virtues he points out justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, virtue. I think those are all good things. But the one that has always struck with me frequent reoccurrence to fundamental principles. What are we really about? It's very easy, and I see this in my own institution all the time, that institutions drift. They're created to do a purpose. You know, St. Pius is created to, to bring the, the values of the gospel to the students, to bring them to uh, goodness, discipline, and knowledge. But it starts to drift to St. Pius exists to promote St. Pius. St. Pius exists to make things really good for the students and teachers at St. Pius. That, that I had a spirited conversation with the science department about well, how do you decide who's going to get into your honors club? Well, we look at their test results. Well, what else do you look at? Well, we look at their test results. <laughs> that, that's the best criteria? Well, if we look at anything else, it'll create controversy among the parents. Do we exist to create concord within this institution? Or do we exist to get the best possible class for every single student? Maybe if we stir up a little more controversy with the parents, we'll get kids in a better situation. Don't you think we ought to look at that? No, it, it's going to create too much work for us. Okay. Um, 
you know, it, it, anyway, I, I should not be self-righteous about this. Uh, <laughs> You're not being self-righteous. Uh, and then my, my last, I know it's a final thought, but this is my last final, final thought. Um, going forward, what has allowed me to survive 25 years in education has been, I have to, every year I have to remind myself what are my limits. I have 180 days, I have 45 minutes, I have the students in front of me. I don't have the students I want in front of me, and every year I'll look out and say, oh my God, I can't believe what the reading level is this year. <laughs> well, that's what it is. And I can either be angry about that and bang my head on the table about it, or I can decide, okay, then I'm gonna have to scaffold this thing differently. Maybe I'm not gonna be able to accomplish as much. Okay, what am I willing to sacrifice to do that? Two days ago, or three days ago, I'm presenting in my pre-algebra class about how to solve an equation. I look out and I realize, you guys, we've been working on this three days. You have no clue what I'm doing right now. It's going to take us at least four more to figure this thing out. Yeah. I can either be angry that it's taking you guys way too long in my mind to do this, or I can accept that this is what it is and then figure out where, what I'm going to cut out to get four more days. It turns out I'm cutting out some analysis on probability and statistics. Much as I love for the kids to understand how the casinos are cheating them, it's going to have to be in a different context. Mm -hmm. um, I got to make a decision. Uh, find allies where you can find allies. I knew in my own department, the three teachers I worked with were on board with transforming the way we were going to do the world history curriculum. I knew the government teacher was not. I knew my fellow department head in US history would be interested but had a lot of other things on his plate at that moment and probably couldn't help a lot. And I, I could be angry with that or I could simply say, you know what, I'm gonna move forward with what I've got. Um, and so to understand these are the limits that I have to operate in and I'm gonna operate within those limits, but that I can't find allies where I can find allies. And then finally to never, understand, never underestimate the power of example. I don't know how many times I had the conversation with Sheila she was teaching world history and American government. And I was essentially doing a lot of heavy lifting on world history, putting together the instructional materials, putting together the tests, and she kept saying, this isn't fair. I'm not pulling my own weight in world history. This isn't fair that you're doing the work. And I said, this is what I need from you. I need you to, make it, to do a really good job with world history. And I need you to do a really good job with government. You've got your own ideas about how you can transform government. You've only got enough energy to do either government well with the instructional materials there or to do the instructional materials really well in world history. I can help you with world history. And if you can be an example for government, you can then be an example for the entire department and we can bring this thing forward. And that made the difference that now American government is looking a lot more like what we did with American history. Uh, I'm sorry, with, with world history. And American history is looking a lot more like with world history. And we didn't do that through coercive power. We didn't threaten anyone that if you don't change the way you're teaching, you don't change the way you do unit planning, you don't change the way you plan your curriculum, we're going to fire you all. One, because I didn't have that power, and even if I did, I can't use it that way. But what we did was give an example of this will actually work. Um, and to take inspiration from that. But sometimes you may be the only, um, you know, it may feel like you are the only one sort of moving the thing forward. But don't underestimate the power of example. That you may, there may be more, much more going on than you think. That's where I want to leave it. Comments, mm -hmm. questions, anger. Mm -hmm. <laughs>